when we talk about uh, diastolic function, then when we go on to diastolic dysfunction, we acknowledge that the heart essentially have a systolic function when it contracts and pump blood out. And then there's a diastolic function where the heart relaxes, fills with blood in order for it to pump blood out. So um, when we look at diastole, so you have to understand diastole. So diastole is that period where the heart fills with blood, but it is broken down into your IVRT. So as soon as the aortic valve, and the same thing goes on for the right side, as, as soon as the aortic valve close, the mitral valve is still closed for that short period of time. And that is the period of time we call the IVRT. Then the mitral valve opens and you have suction of blood from the left atrium into the left ventricle. And uh, we call that the, the E-velocity, okay? And then you have an equalization of pressure between the left atrium and left ventricle, we call that diastasis. And then after diastasis, then the atrium contracts and pump an additional amount of blood into the left ventricle. So diastole is those different phase, and um, you need to go over it fully understand the different phase. And um, but there are there are there are things that we use to assess the the, the the diastolic function. There are parameters that we use to assess how well the heart is relaxing and filling with blood. And some of those things is we look at the mitral inflow and um, we talk about we talk about the, the E velocity. So the E velocity is 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 you know is a, gives us a good indication of how well the heart is filling. Uh, I would say it's it's a suction. So it's it usually in a young healthy individual, it's um it's a fairly you know, a uh, good number. It's usually above one meter per second. <clears throat> um, and uh, what we call, so when you look at the E velocities, so you have to measure it. And then we talk about the deceleration time. The deceleration time is the time from peak E to, to, to the baseline. Uh, so that also, you can use that to assess diastolic function. Uh, the normal, the normal deceleration time is probably about 150, 160 to about 250 milliseconds. Um, and then, you know, we, the, you have the diastasis. The diastasis is not evident in some patients, um, and, and some patients is fairly prominent we talk about equalization of pressure. So there is no flow in, 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 in diastasis. Sometimes it's extremely short, so you can't really see it. And in, if the patient is bradycardic, then you can see, you, sometimes you can see it on the, uh, on the Doppler tracing. And then the A velocity, it's a very good indicator of um, your diastolic function and ends dysfunction. Uh, when the pressure, when we talk about left atrial pressure, when the left atrial pressure increases, then your A velocity also increase. Okay? So when the left atrial pressure increase, your A velocity also increase. The, um, the, 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 the ratio, your E to A ratio is a very important one. As, as we mentioned before, in a normal healthy individual, the E is greater than the A. Um, your IVRT, uh, which is the period of time, so remember the first phase of diastole is your IVRT. 
that's usually about 60 to about 90 milliseconds and uh, if you have if you have a problem with diastolic function then it can either increase or decrease so when we talk about diastolic dysfunction that is you have a problem with diastolic function there are two well you know we, we, we talk about um, mildly abnormal diastolic uh, uh, dysfunction where just the e the e velocity is smaller than the a velocity so when you look at your e to a ratio that e to a ratio is less than one okay so a small e and a big a will 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 tell you something about the the, the grading of the diastolic uh dysfunction and we're going to go over that um your deceleration time can also give you an indication of how severe the diastolic dysfunction is and your IVRT. So when we look at diastolic dysfunction, we can grade it. The, 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 the worse the diastolic dysfunction, um, you will get larger and larger A until, until you get to the worst stage <clears throat> that we talk about a restrictive physiology. So you can have just a mildly abnormal diastolic uh, dysfunction and we talk about abnormal relaxation. So, so if you look at the heart, the heart has to relax in order to fill with blood. So with early diastolic dysfunction, the heart is not relaxing properly to fill with blood. So this is a problem with relaxation. So the heart does not relax properly. So that's the early diastolic dysfunction. The heart does not relax properly. And then as the diastolic dysfunction gets worse, <clears throat> then you start having a problem with compliance. That is the, you know, the, 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 the heart is not very compliant. Okay, so the early stage of diastolic dysfunction is a problem with relaxation. And then as it progresses, you, you, you go on to a problem with uh, compliance. Um, so so ju just, you know, remember the heart has to fill with blood. The heart has to fill with blood. So if it is not relaxing properly it's not going to fill to its full extent and the as that get progressively more severe then the left atrial volume because remember now the the, the atrium has to pump blood into the ventricle so if the ventricle is not relaxing properly if you start having problem with compliance then the pressure in the ventricle is gonna go up and that's gonna increase the pressure in the atrium. So the atrium is gonna get larger. So the, so the atrium will get larger and larger. So as your diastolic dysfunction gets worse, then the atrium gets larger. So just you know, try and see if you can, uh, you, if you can just try and 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 and, and uh, put that in your mind's eye and think about it. So as as the diastolic dysfunction get more severe, <clears throat> because the pressure is gonna go up. The pressure is going to go up in the ventricle. The pressure is going to go up in the atrium. So the atrium is going to get larger. So the worst, the stage of the diastolic dysfunction, you're going to get, the, the, the atrium is going to get larger or bigger. Not only the atrium is going to get uh, bigger, but 
the 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 velocity the a velocity will get a little higher okay the h of the the a velocity will get a little higher and we talk about a pseudo normal so in a normal healthy individual the e velocity is larger than the a velocity okay when you start having a problem with compliance, then the A velocity, sorry, the E velocity falls. So the E is now shorter than the A. When the pressure start to increase, then you get it, it, the E and A sort of reverse back to looking normal. Okay, so the E now becomes bigger than the A. So it looks normal, that's why we call it pseudonormal, but it's not normal. Because the, if, you check the, if, you, if you check the left atrial pressure, you're gonna find that left atrial pressure is increased. You'll also find that the, 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 left, end, the um, left atrial volume is also gonna increase. And another very important uh, indicator of diastolic dysfunction is the, is the pulmonary pressures. Okay, um, the pulmonary pressures. We have not done. Um, we have not done hemodynamics. We have not uh, done the right side of the heart, but we can check the pulmonary pressures. So, if just think about it again. As diastolic dysfunction get more severe, you're gonna have increasing pressures in the left atrium. That's gonna put pressure on your pulmonary circuit, the pulmonary uh, circulatory system. And that eventually is gonna increase your pulmonary pressures. So pulmonary pressure is a very good indicator of diastolic dysfunction, okay? So the worse the, the grade of the diastolic dysfunction, the greater the pulmonary pressures. And also the pulmonary vein uh, flow, because we're talking about increasing increasing the left atrial pressure. So if you if you're going to increase your left atrial pressure, then what's going to happen? Your systolic component of your pulmonary vein is going to get progressively smaller. So the worse the grade of the diastolic dysfunction the smaller the component of the the, the, the the systolic component of the pulmonary vein flow. So when we put everything together, we can come up with a grading of diastolic dysfunction, which is just looking at the severity of the diastolic dysfunction. So you should have gone over the previous um, sessions so that you know you, you can fully understand what we 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 are going to embark on uh, today we're going to look at how to grade diastolic dysfunction so you should also take when you when you when you, especially when you're looking at someone with a normal left ventricular systolic function age is very important because remember what we said a normal young individual the e is bigger than the a whereas someone say 60 and above is, you know that's usually not the case. The, the 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 E starts to fall, and the A in a lot of these um, individuals will be greater than the E. So, if you see someone say age twenty, and the E is much bigger than the A, that might be a normal individual. That may be normal. If you see someone at age 60 and the E is bigger than the A, that might be what we call pseudonormal. So it may be, it may be diastolic dysfunction where you have elevation of the left atrial pressure to get what we call pseudonormal. So the age of the individual, the age of the patient that you're, you're studying is very important. Um, in LT sedentary elderly, um, 
diastolic dysfunction appears to be due in part to L, uh, increase in LV stiffness. So remember what we what we said the the, the, the first thing that happens when someone develops diastolic dysfunction is abnormal relaxation. Then as it progresses, you have increased stiffness. Okay. So if if you get an older person and you want to evaluate for left atrial pressures, so remember your E to uh, E prime, E to E prime, um, if it's greater, than, especially if you're looking at the medial. So remember you, with your E prime, it could be the medial annulus or the lateral annulus. If you're gonna use the medial annulus, the E to E prime ratio is well, greater than 15. If you're gonna use the lateral annulus, then the E to E prime ratio is greater than 13. And then you can have a average. You can have an average E prime where you take your lateral and medial, you add them and divide it by two. So if you have an older patient and you do your EE prime ratio and it's greater than 14, that, that's, that's usually not normal, okay? The E to E prime, if it's, you know, if it's greater than say 15, if you're looking at the medial E prime, that's usually not normal. It suggests elevated pressures, okay? Also, uh, what you will find out is that if, if you have someone who have, say, say they come to you and they have a, 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 a E, a e to a ratio which is greater than one, so a, a, a fairly decent size E and a relatively small A. So they are 50 and you're not sure if this is normal or abnormal, because it could be normal. That is why we call it pseudonormal, if it's abnormal. What would you, that individual, you can have them do the Valsalva maneuver you can have them do the Valsalva maneuver and um, see what happens. So when you do the Valsalva maneuver, you know, it's, we usually say you strain, you, you force breathe against a closed glottis. Essentially, you have, you have the individual strain, like, like you know, if they're going to have a bowel movement or something like that, you strain. If, if it's pseudonormal, say for instance, the patient does have diastolic dysfunction, a fairly decent size E and a small A, and a strain, that can, when you do the Valsalva maneuver, that can bring out the diastolic dysfunction. So they start out with a big E and a small A, but when you have them do the Valsalva maneuver, and you look at the tracing, now the E becomes much smaller than the A. So you can bring out the diastolic dysfunction by having these patients who have pseudonormal uh, to have what we call uh, a, a, a abnormal relaxation pattern. So the Valsalva maneuver is a very important uh, tool that we can use when assessing diastolic uh, dysfunction. Again, <clears throat> it, it you know scientifically it is force breath against a closed glottis, okay, or you just strain you just tell the individual to strain. Also, you can look at the pulmonary vein as we had mentioned before. The, 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 as the grade of the diastolic dysfunction gets worse, then the systolic component will get smaller. Also, the atrial flow reversal velocity will get um, larger. And if you look at the atrial velocity to the mitral uh, A velocity, the, that, that um, <clears throat> difference in the atrial flow velocity 
and the mitral A velocity, uh, the greater the difference, will, you'll have the greater um, grade of your diastolic uh, dysfunction. So let's look in. Let's look in. Look in it in, into a little bit more depth. So, <clears throat> so again, this is our mitral inflow. Okay, and we've been we we, we went over this. So mitral inflow. So apical four chamber view. Your sample volume is at the tip of the mitral leaflet, and you get, you know. Of course, your IVRT is going to be there. Then the E velocity, which is a rapid suction of blood from the left atrium to the left ventricle. Diastasis, where you have equalization of pressure, left atrium, left ventricle. So if the pressures are the same, you're not going to get any flow, so cessation of flow. And then the atrium contracts, giving rise to the atrial velocity. And then we have our tissue or tissue uh, Doppler imaging. <clears throat> so you look at the mitral annulus, and if you use the medial, you put the sample volume, the medial annulus, and you get your S prime velocity, which is due to the, the annulus moving upwards in systole. And then you get two diastolic component. Uh, your early is your E prime, the late is your A prime, OK? So again, the normal E to A ratio is greater than one, and usually it's a young LT individual. Okay. The, 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 the lateral E prime is usually in a in a normal individual, lateral E prime is usually greater than the medial E prime. Okay. Again, as we had mentioned, the Valsalva maneuver can help to distinguish normal LV filling from pseudonormal. So with pseudonormal, it looks normal. The E is bigger than the A. You know, but you you, you don't know if it's normal uh, unless you do a few maneuvers. Um, so so the valves have a maneuver can help to distinguish normal LV filling from pseudonormal filling and whether restrictive LV filling is reversible or not. Okay? When we talk about restrictive, so the restrictive pattern is when, when, you, when you take the E to A ratio. If your E to A ratio is greater than 2, your E to A ratio is greater than 2. That is what we call a restrictive, uh, restrictive physiology. So the early stage of diastolic, dysfunction, you have a problem with relaxation, okay? So the E smaller than the A. Then the next stage is your pseudonormal, where the E, sometimes it's, it's not bigger than the, the, the A, sometimes it's, but it's pretty close, or it may be bigger than the A and looking normal. That is what we call the pseudonormal. That's the next stage, OK? And with each stage, the left atrial pressure gets higher and higher. The, the, the left atrial volumes, volume gets higher and higher. The pulmonary pressure, higher and higher, OK? And then with the end stage heart, we talk about a restrictive uh, physiology. So restriction, if you have a pattern which is looks restrictive, that usually suggests a very severe stage of diastolic dysfunction. And those patients usually have serious heart problems. The hallmark of restrictive physiology is your E to A ratio greater than 2. OK? You can also use the, um, the Valsalva maneuver to, to look at those patients. Because if you do the Valsalva maneuver in someone with restrictive physiology, and it, 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 you, 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 have a prob you have a pattern that 
reversing, looking like it's getting back to normal, then those patients, you can treat them aggressively and they will improve as opposed to someone who has a restrictive physiology, E to A ratio greater than two. If you do the Valsava maneuver and it remains restrictive physiology, those patients do poorly, okay? So a decrease in your E to A, e to a ratio by more than 50% is either specific for increased LV filling pressures and diastolic of dysfunction. It's very important that when you're doing your valsalva maneuver and you're looking at your mitral inflow, don't just do it at the time when you're doing, I mean, for a short period of time. You have to do it for at least 10 seconds. So let, let it continuously run, okay? Don't just do it and stop at least for 10 seconds. So you tell the patient to strain, okay? And you let it run for at least 10 seconds. So continuously recording the mitral inflow using the PW Doppler for 10 seconds during the strain phase of the, the Valsalva maneuver. So again, if you're looking at your pulmonary vein flow, then the, the increase in your atrial flow velocity duration versus the mitral A duration is consistent with increased uh, left atrial pressure, left ventricular, end diastolic pressure, and diastolic dysfunction. So remember your, your A velocity in your mitral inflow, it has a duration. When you look at your pulmonary vein flow, the atrial flow velocity also have a duration. What we are saying is that um, as the diastolic dysfunction gets worse, the, if the, the, the atrial flow velocity duration is getting larger as compared to the mitral A uh, velocity duration, then that, is, that suggests worsening of the diastolic dysfunction. All right, so, so these are some tissue Doppler recordings, and we have four examples. So with the first one, uh, the Doppler setting and sample volume are, are location are optimal. Remember, it is mitral annulus. So this is apical four chamber view Curses right there, the sample volume is at the medial annulus, and you have to put it at the medial annulus. Let's, if you don't do that, then everything is going to be incorrect, okay? So, again, you get a pattern like this. This first velocity is, is what we call this is your IVCT, IVCT, isovolumic contraction uh, time. That's what this is. So this, the next one is your S prime, S prime velocity, because the, the, the annulus is gonna move upwards in systole. Then you get an early diastolic and a late diastolic. The early diastolic is so, so the early diastolic is what we call your E prime. And then the late diastolic is what we call your A prime. So this, this initial downward is not your E prime, but this is your IVRT. So you have to know how to label your, your tissue Doppler velocities accurately. So this is your IVCT, then your S prime. This is your IVRT, then your E prime. And then this is your A prime, okay? So, you, you, you know, if you're gonna do echo, you have to get it right because if you give faulty measurements, you're gonna, it's gonna lead to faulty 
assessment and you know you know faulty assessment is, is never good so you have to be um clear now this in in b the sample volume is placed uh, in the ventricular septum not the annulus so it's this is way up in the 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 the, the septum so these measurements are not correct so you know, you will probably miss the diastolic dysfunction or you may give, you know, some other grade of the diastolic dysfunction. So it is not, it's not supposed to be in the septum, it's supposed to be in the annulus. And then in C, uh, in C, the, 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 the Doppler setting is suboptimal. So you can see it is, is, it is uh, you have low gain here, so it's not, and then in this one, it is um, the, the, the gain is uh, you have a high filter. So it's supposed to be the annulus, not the, 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 the uh, septum. And then in this, in, in A over here, the, the sample volume is in the left ventricular cavity. And I've seen all of these. So be careful when you're doing your study. Okay, because if 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 you give me some numbers and they, I, a lot of time I don't report on it because it's it's, it's faulty and you cannot report on faulty, um, you know, make an assessment on faulty measurements. So if uh, if the the measurements are not at, not accurate, I'm not going to report on it. It's better not to report on something than to give a false um, assessment. So this is in the LV cavity, and then B the sample volume is that the uh, the basal segment of the lateral, just like where we had it in the, the, the septum, this is the basal segment. So you don't want to do that as well. Okay? And then in C, the, it's partly, out, it's outside of the heart. So it, it's outside of heart. So pay attention to what you're doing. Because I've seen all of this. People, you know, not, not paying attention. And then in D, it is actually in the left atrium. So, you know, and I see this a lot of time with, 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 with when they're doing TAPSI as well. So, you know, if I don't report on your TAPSI is because it's faulty, okay? Um, so pay attention to, to, to what you're doing. Mm. All right, and then if you look at your, so, so this is our Valsalva maneuver. So, you have this pattern, which could be normal. So you have a big A and a small, sorry, big E, a small A. This could be normal, you know, but it could also be pseudo-normal, okay? It looks normal, but it could be abnormal. So what we're saying, you do the Valsalva maneuver, okay? Patient a forced breath against a closed glottis, okay? Let the patient breathe out, close the glottis, Essentially, let the patient strain, and if you get this pattern, then this is actually pseudonormal, okay? So the valsalva maneuver in a patient with this patient of grade 2, and we'll go over the grading of the diastolic dysfunction, uh, this patient of grade 2, so-called pseudonormal, okay? So at baseline, the E to A ratio was 1.3, but when you have the patient valsalva, it, 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 it changes to 0.6, okay? It changed to an uh, impaired relaxation pattern, okay? So that's grade two. So we actually, when we grade diastolic dysfunction, we, we, we have three grades. I'll go over that. Anyway, again, continuous recording of the mitral inflow during the Valsalva maneuver for at least 10 seconds. Okay, so you, you, you see you start with your E greater than the A, and then when the patient Valsalva, just continuously record, just continue to record, and you can see it changes to a pseudonormal pattern. Okay, so when you see something like this, it's consistent with elevated filling pressures, elevated left atrial pressures. So <clears throat> the Valsalva maneuver is very important uh, especially in, in patients with uh, the pseudonormal pattern. 
And then again, if you look at your pulmonary, uh, okay, so the pulmonary artery systolic pressure, as we mentioned before, as the, 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 the diastolic dysfunction gets more severe because the pressure is going to go backwards. It's going to increase the pressure backwards. Your, your pulmonary artery systolic pressure is going to increase. So if you look at tricuspid regurgitation, how we, how we assess pulmonary artery systolic pressure is to look at our tricuspid regurgitation velocity. So the, the, the greater the tricuspid regurgitation velocity, the greater the pulmonary artery systolic pressure. And, uh, you know, for those of you who have not done that lecture, one, once we get there, you'll understand what we're talking about. So the greater the pulmonary artery systolic pressure, the greater the tricuspid regurgitation velocity. Okay? Um, so, the, as the diastolic dysfunction gets worse, the pulmonary artery systolic pressure gets higher. And it's, it's important to know that the resting values are relatively age independent. What we're saying is that you could, you could be as whole as dirt, your pulmonary pressure should not increase. So pulmonary pressures do not increase with age, okay? Again, left atrial enlargement in the, in the absence of any type of atrial arrhythmia is usually associated with diastolic dysfunction. So what we're saying is that once you rule out anything that can cause left atrial enlargement, so you have to, because if the patient have atrial fibrillation or long-standing atrial flutter, that can increase the left atrial volume. If the patient has mitral regurgitation or mitral stenosis, those things can increase left atrial volume. So once you rule out those things, the left atrial enlargement is uh, usually associated with diastolic dysfunction. Okay, very important. Um, also, uh, if, if left ventricular hypertrophy, if someone has LVH, so when we talk about LVH, left ventricular hypertrophy, when something hypertroph, then it 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 get thick, it get thicker. So if the left ventricle is thick, you can assume that you know the, 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 there's probably gonna be some diastolic dysfunction. It's not a hundred percent, so. You know, even though you, you, you expect it, be careful. Don't just take it as gospel. You'll probably need to do a few other maneuvers to, to. All right. So this is what we talk, when we talk about comparing the mitral inflow A velocity duration and the pulmonary vein atrial reversal uh, velocity this is what we're talking about. So your mitral inflow, so you can, the duration is the time that an event occurs. So when we talk about atrial, uh, mitral A duration, we're talking about how much time it takes for the atrium to, to, to contract. So from the, the beginning to the end. So you find out the time, duration, it's okay? And then the same thing for your pulmonary vein flow. So this is a pulmonary vein flow. It's, this patient does have some diastolic problem because the, the systolic velocity, smaller than the diastolic the velocity, velocity, this is your atrial flow reversal. Again, so remember, pulmonary vein is draining into the left atrium. In systole, the, the, the mitral valve is closed, the pulmonary vein is going to drain into the left atrium. In diastole, the mitral valve is open, you're still going to have pulmonary blood flowing into the left atrium. But when the atrium contracts, you're going to get reversal of blood flow into the pulmonary vein. So that is why it's below the baseline, because when the atrium, atrium contracts, it's going to push blood back into the pulmonary vein. 
okay so this is our atrial reversal and it has a duration it has a duration so the the mitral inflow and pulmonary venous flow from a patient with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction if 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 you if you're keen you'll see that your e to a ratio here is probably greater than two so this is what we, this is our restrictive physiology once your e to a ratio is greater than two this is restrictive physiology okay this is uh, you know a very sick heart so to speak and then you see you have a small systolic and a fairly large blast of the component your pulmonary uh, vein flow so you see you have your increase e to a ratio greater than two your reduced systolic compared to diastolic in your pulmonary vein and then both findings are consistent with increase in the left atrial pressure okay so what we are saying is this duration the atrial flow the atrial reversal the atrial reversal flow or atrial flow reversal if this duration is greater than your a in your mitral inflow then that's also suggestive of increased left atrial pressures all right <clears throat> Uh, we can also use something we, we, we call um, global LV uh, longitudinal function to, to, to assess diastolic dysfunction. It's not commonly done, but you can you can you can use that. And basically, what we're saying is that in in systole, in systole, remember they. The mitral annulus is going to move up towards the apex. In systole, the mitral annulus is going to move towards the apex. And so that is what we call the LV longitudinal systolic function. So it's supposed to move up a certain uh, uh, length. Okay, and that is what we call. Uh, the so-called MAPSI, which is mitral and the plane systolic exc uh, excursion. So in systole, the annulus is supposed to move up towards the apex, a certain number. Okay, if it, it, if, if it moves less than that uh, length, then it suggests that there is problem. Um, and then we can also look at what we call uh, the, the mitral annular systolic velocity, the so-called S prime. So not only that is not only the, the septum, sorry, not only the mitral annular is supposed to move up at a certain distance, but it's supposed to move at a certain speed. And that is what we call the tissue doppler derived mitral annular systolic velocity. And then you can do something what we, what we call a global uh, longitudinal um, strain. So strain is just when you have a change in the length and we we use um, what we call speckle tracking for that. So, you know, we have a separate lecture where we do strain and strain rate. So you'll probably understand that a little bit more. But, you know, these are, you, you know, these are things that are gonna be abnormal in diastolic dysfunction. You know, how much they, 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 the, the mitral annulus moves up in, in, in systole and how fast it moves. All right. Um, so this, this is this is in a patient with um, reduced ejection fraction. Okay. So if you look if if you if you um, look at your mitral inflow and you get a pattern looking like this. So you know your E is greater than A. If you're not sure if it's normal or pseudonormal, you can do Valsalva maneuver and see. But if you get this so-called L wave, so you have your E, your A, and you get something you, 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 you've never seen before, so-called L wave. This L wave suggests increased left atrial pressure. So, you know, you can see the, the, the E velocity was 96 centimeters per second. A was 65. 
and you get this mid diastolic flow, the so called L velocity. And um, it, 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 it's present because of a slow and impure relaxation and increased pressure. So your L velocity suggests increased pressure. Okay? All right, so look out for that. Again, you can see your so-called L velocity there. And then when you look at your tissue Doppler imaging, you get a surrogate. So, you know, you get your E, this is the A, and you get this middle diastolic um, uh, velocity. So this is your tissue Doppler uh, equivalent of your L wave, okay? It suggests elevated left atrial pressure. All right, so some additional pointers before we go on to the grading. Okay, so we, we look at all the things that can be affected, and then, you know, as the diastolic dysfunction gets more severe, you know, what, 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 what's going to happen? So we look at four variables. So even though, you know, I showed you more than four, it may be confusing. So we, we, we just look at four to, to, to come up with the grade of the diastolic dysfunction. We just look at four variables. You can, all, you can use the others to confirm the grade, but to keep it simple, we look at four. And we look at the annular E prime velocity, the annular E prime velocity. You cannot have diastolic dysfunction unless your E prime is abnormal. You cannot have diastolic dysfunction unless your E prime is abnormal. So I don't want anybody telling me that this patient have grade two diastolic dysfunction and the E prime is eight centimeters per second. It doesn't, doesn't work, it doesn't happen. So you cannot have diastolic dysfunction if you have a normal annular E prime. Okay, and for the medial or the septal, we talk about an annular E prime less than seven centimeters per second. And for the lateral, we talk about an annular E prime less than 10 centimeters per second. So annular E prime for the medial or septal less than seven centimeters per second for the lateral, less than 10 centimeters per second. If you're gonna use your E to E prime ratio, remember E to E prime ratio suggests elevated left atrial pressure. Then if you're gonna use a septal or medial, then that e to e, e to E prime ratio should be more than 15. If you're gonna use your lateral E prime, then the E to E prime ratio is usually greater than 13. If you're gonna use a average, then it's more than 14. If you have these things present, then it suggests elevated left atrial pressures. Also, we look at the left atrial volume index, left atrial volume index. Not the left atrial volume, the left atrial volume index. And when you index something, you divide it by the body surface area. And the magic number is 34. 34 mLs per meter square. 34 mLs per meter square. And then the last one is your tricuspid peak velocity. If it's greater than 2.8, then it suggests elevated left atrial pressures. So these are the four variables you're gonna look at in order to grade your diastolic dysfunction. Your annular E prime, if, you, if it's the medial, less than seven, lateral, less than 10, then the E to the E E prime ratio, E E prime ratio. You have to know which one you're gonna use because the ratio varies with the site you're gonna 
choose your EPROM. For septal, greater than 15. For the lateral, greater than 13. And the average, greater than 14. Okay? And then the left atrial volume index, greater than 34. TR peak velocity, more than 2.8 meters per second. So what we are saying is that if you have these things present, it suggests elevated pressures, left atrial pressures. Okay? So when you, when you grade your diastolic dysfunction, the grade is grade 1, grade 2, and grade 3. In the old system, you had a grade 4. We don't have a grade 4 in the current system. Grade 1, grade 2, grade 3. If, if you have three variables present, then it suggests elevated filling pressures and ends a grade 2 diastolic dysfunction. Grade 1 diastolic dysfunction, the, 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 the left atrial pressure is normal. Grade 1 diastolic dysfunction, the left atrial pressure is normal. For grade 2 and grade 3, the left atrial pressures are elevated. Grade 2 is your so-called pseudonormal, okay? but the left atrial pressures are elevated. So you need three of the variables. You need three of the variables to be positive for you to make an assessment of elevated filling pressures. And if your E to A ratio is less than two, then that's your grade two diastolic dysfunction. For grade three diastolic dysfunction, you have to have what we call a restrictive filling pattern. So your E to A so your, your E to A ratio have to be greater than two. You cannot have a grade three diastolic dysfunction unless your E to A ratio is greater than two. And then you're gonna have the other variables falling into place, suggesting elevated left atrial pressures. So your TR velocity is going to be greater than 2.8 meters per second. Left atrial volume index is going to be more than 34. And your uh, E to E prime ratio will be elevated. And the, 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 the absolute value depends on which one you're looking at. Okay? So to evaluate left atrial pressure. So, so the, the bottom line is left atrial pressure is going to define what's going on. If you have a normal left atrial pressure and you have diastolic dysfunction, it's, it's a grade one. It's a grade one diastolic dysfunction. If you have diastolic dysfunction and you have elevated left atrial pressure, then that's a grade two or grade three. You can only have a grade three if your E to A ratio is greater than two. So the things that you're gonna look at to ev evaluate filling pressures or left atrial pressure, um, your mitral uh, uh, inflow velocity to some extent, you're gonna look at your mitral annular uh, e prime velocity, but the, 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 the most important things is your E to E prime ratio, peak TR velocity, and the left atrial maximum volume index. Volume index. Um, again, as we, we have mentioned before, there are other variables that are going to be affected, such as your pulmonary vein or your LV global. Uh, longitudinal strain by speckle tracking echo, but you can just use those things to support your assessment. Okay.
if the patient have these conditions, do not use the mitral uh, inflow velocities. And you know, some of you guys have have seen that. You know, the patient have these conditions, and you send me some numbers, and I don't comment on the numbers. So because atrial fibrillation will change the dynamics, so atrial fibrillation, moderate mitral ulnar calcification, not mild, but moderate, severe. If the patient has mitral stenosis more than moderate, you can't use your mitral inflow velocity. If the patient has mitral regurgitation more than moderate, if the patient has had mitral valve repair, a prosthetic valve, mitral prosthetic valve, LV assist device, if the patient have left bundle branch block or ventricular paced rhythm, you cannot use your mitral inflow velocity. So with these conditions, you have to use other uh, parameters to evaluate diastolic dysfunction. But your mitral inflow velocity you cannot use in these conditions. Again, to evaluate left atrial pressure. So everything boils down to left atrial pressure. If the left atrial pressure is elevated, then it's either grade two or grade three diastolic dysfunction. If the left atrial pressure is normal, then it's grade one. So if if, if, your, if your E to A ratio is less than 0.8, so what we're saying, you have a small E and a big A, and if you look at your E velocity and it's less than 0.5 or 50 centimeters per second, that left atrial pressure cannot be elevated, okay? So once, you know, if, if everything satisfies and you look at your E velocity, and your E velocity is less than 0.5, then the left atrial pressure is normal, and you're gonna have grade one diastolic dysfunction. Once you have elevated left atrial pressure, once the left atrial pressure is elevated, and your E to A ratio is greater than two, it's gonna be grade three. But remember, remember that in a young individual, less than 40, the E to A may be greater than two. So you have to take the age, as we have pointed out before, age into consideration, because normal young individuals can have an E to A greater than two, okay? But if the patient have diastolic dysfunction and your E to A is greater than two, it's grade three. And then normal individual is going to have normal E prime. So if you get if you get a, a, a 20, 8 year old with E to A greater than two, and they have a normal E prime, that's a normal person, you know. All right. However, if if they if they all the, the variables, you know, E to A is less than 0.8, that means you have a small E and a big A, and your E is greater than 0.5 centimeters per second, 0.5 meters per second, or greater than 50 centimeters per second, and your TR jet is greater than 2.8, um, your left atrial volume index is, is, is elevated, and your, your um, E, e prime ratio is, is elevated. Um, you know, you can also use your pulmonary vein, uh, looking at your systolic and diastolic component to, 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 to properly grade the diastolic dysfunction. Okay? All right, so this, this, this chart goes over, you know, all the stuff that we have mentioned. So patient comes to you, keep it simple. You, you need to look at your four, four variables. Okay, <clears throat> so you need to look at your E prime because E prime is gonna tell you whether the patient have diastolic dysfunction, yes or no. If the E prime is greater than 
greater than uh, seven centimeters per second, the patient do not have gas cell dysfunction. But if the E prime is less than seven centimeters per second, they may have diastolic dysfunction. So if the left atrial pressure is normal, okay, if, 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 if you're looking at relaxation, relaxation is normal. So, so a normal individual gonna have normal left atrial pressures, okay? The E to A ratio, I mean, maybe greater than 0.8. So the e, might, the e might be a little bit smaller than the A as one age, or if, if it's a, a young individual, <clears throat> the E is gonna be bigger than the A. When you look at the, the, the so they have average uh, E E prime ratio, okay? The average is when you get the medial and lateral, add them together divided by two. But if you're using if you're accustomed to use the, um, the, the, the medial EE prime ratio, then the cutoff is, is 15, all right? But if you're gonna use the average EE prime ratio, again, EE prime ratio, when it's elevated, suggests elevated left atrial pressures, that's what that's telling me. And then the TR velocity, if it's less than 2.8. So all of these things are normal. So this individual is normal, okay? All right, so the left atrial volume index, if it's normal, the, T, the peak TR velocity if it's less than 2.8, your EE prime if it's normal, and you know, so, and then your E to A ratio. So all these things, normal individual. However, if the patient has grade one diastolic dysfunction, so your grade one diastolic dysfunction is what we call impaired relaxation. So remember the first thing, the first thing that's gonna happen when you have diastolic dysfunction is relaxation. You're gonna have impaired relaxation. So, and your left atrial pressure in grade one diastolic dysfunction is normal, low or normal. You'll have a small E and a big A small e and a big a and your la pressure using your ee prime is going to be normal okay your peak tr velocity is going to be less than 2.8 okay so this is your grade one diastolic dysfunction they have impaired relaxation early early in their diastolic dysfunction. So everything is essentially normal. The only thing that's abnormal is their E prime, okay? Relaxation is impaired, normal left atrial pressures, small e, big A, E, e prime is normal, TR velocity normal, left atrial volume index is normal. It might be slightly increased, but it's normal. With your grade two, this is our so-called pseudonormal. You're, you're gonna have impaired relaxation, impaired LV relaxation. Your left atrial pressure is gonna be elevated. So you're gonna look at all the surrogates for left atrial pressure elevation. Look at all the surrogates for left atrial pressure elevation. So you're talking about your E to E prime, okay? If it's a medial, it's gonna be greater than 15, okay? Your TR velocity is gonna be more than 2.8 meters per second. Left atrial volume index is gonna be more than 34 mLs per meter squared. So this is your grade two diastolic dysfunction. With grade three, they have to have restrictive physiology. So in addition to your E prime being small, okay, the E to A ratio have to be greater than two. You cannot have grade three diastolic dysfunction if your E to A ratio is not greater than two. And then you're gonna have evidence of elevating filling pressures. If you look at your E E prime ratio, that's gonna, if you use the medial, it's gonna be more than 15. For the lateral, greater than 13. And for the average, more than 14. And then your TR velocity is gonna be more than 2.8.
left atrial volume index is going to be more than um, 34. This is your grade 3 diastolic dysfunction. So only three grades you have. You cannot have diastolic dysfunction unless your tissue Doppler uh, E prime is less than 7. And then once you get your, once you establish that there is diastolic dysfunction, then you put it into a grade. If there's no evidence of left atrial pressure increase, then that's a grade one. And they will have E to A ratio will be less than 0.8, so small e, big A. E, e prime will be normal. TR, peak TR velocity will be less than 2.8. Left atrial volume index, usually normal. With grade two, your so-called pseudonormal. LV relaxation is going to be impaired. Elevated left atrial pressure. So all the things that suggest elevated left atrial pressures will be evident, such as your elevated EE prime, elevated TR velocity, increased uh, left atrial volume index. And then grade three, this is the important thing. You cannot have grade three diastolic dysfunction unless your E to A ratio is more than two. Then the other things, uh, elevated left atrial pressures, as evidenced by, as evidenced by your increase E to E prime uh, velocity, increased TR velocity, increased left atrial volume index. So this chart just go over, you know, what we have just discussed: the gradient of diastolic dysfunction. So you need to go over it because proper assessment of diastolic dysfunction is important, okay? So the important thing to remember, because it can be a little bit confusing, but first you have to make your assessment of diastolic dysfunction. If the tissue Doppler E prime, if the E prime is normal, diastolic dysfunction does not exist, and you move on. Okay? If E prime is normal, then tissue Doppler, then if your E prime is normal, diastolic dysfunction does not exist, and you move on. Then the next thing is to grade it. With grade two diastolic dysfunction, you, you have to have elevated filling pressures. You have to have elevated filling pressures. So TR velocity should be more than 2.8. Left atrial volume index should be more than 34 mLs per meter squared. And your EE prime ratio is going to be elevated. Grade three diastolic dysfunction, you have to have E to A ratio more than 2. E to A ratio greater than 2. So if you keep, if you, if you, if you, if you just do it like that, then, you know, you'll keep it simple and, you know, you will, um, you will be able to make the diagnosis in, in more time than, than not. You can use the other SAR gates if you are having problems, such as your pulmonary, vein, systolic, and diastolic velocity, your atrial flow duration compared to your mitral inflow A duration. Um, you know, you can use those things if you're having problems. So, you know, so if you're going to look at this chart, then you need at least three of the variables to be positive to 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 come up with elevated filling pressures okay so if you have if your e to a ratio is less than one and your e is more than 50 centimeters per second or 0.5 and uh your e to a ratio well e to a ratio is is less than two but um, 
more than that. Okay. You 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 have to establish um, elevate your feeling pressure. So so this, this I think this charge is a little bit unnecessarily confusing. So I mean you can look take your time go over it. But essentially, what the important point is, patient comes to you. E prime is normal. They do not have that diastolic dysfunction. So you cannot talk about any diastolic dysfunction. E prime is less than seven. They may have diastolic dysfunction. So you're going to look at the other things to support that they have diastolic dysfunction. If the left atrial pressure is normal, then that's grade one. And left atrial pressure means that you're going to look at your left atrial volume index. So it's going to be less than 34. You're going to look at your E, E prime uh, ratio. If you use the medial, then if it's less than 15, that's normal. And you're going to look at your TR velocity. If it's less than 2.8, then that's, that's normal. So that would be your grade one. If the patient have diastolic dysfunction, that means your E prime less than seven, and they have evidence of elevated filling pressures, which are, so you need at least three of them to be positive. So E E prime ratio is going to be elevated, TR velocity greater than 2.8, left atrial volume index greater than 34 then that will be your so-called grade two. However, if the E to A ratio is greater than two, then that's grade three. No question asked. Okay? So you can just go over this and uh, make sense of, of what's going on. But essentially, you know, what I, what I just told you, that's how you approach that. Again, Look at the E, the E prime. E prime normal, no diastolic dysfunction. E prime abnormal, diastolic dysfunction. Then you have to grade it. Simple. If the E to A ratio is greater than two, restrictive physiology, grade three. Left atrial pressure elevated by looking at E E prime, TR velocity, left atrial volume, and you can look at the other things too. If that's elevated, grade two. Left atrial pressure normal, grade one. So if you keep it simple like that, 